cool. And then I will. Ooh, people are already popping in here. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I pull that up. Hey. Mm -hmm. Got the uh, ratcheting paper towel holder for one handed speed grabs in the middle of. I actually do need to keep a roll next to me instead of in the kitchen. I hate having to get up to go to the kitchen every time. Yeah. <laughs> I, unfortunately, the only, if the number of paper towels that I use determined the greenness of my painting, I, I kill like a tree. Like every time I paint, it's kind of sad. <laughs> well, do you buy at least the like brown, more organic ones or the white? <laughs> I didn't even know they made brown more organic paper towels, so I'm behind the curve there. <laughs> it's just one of the local stores we have here that has like all organic products. I, I don't oh, even buy them, unfortunately. I do yeah. stick to the white cheap with dollar roll. Yeah. <laughs> I, te I, I tease, I, I make it up in that I actually, I work for a steel company that is the nation's largest recycler of anything. So, <laughs> so I get my, I get my in, uh, saving the world points through that. But <laughs> I would Hi say Kyle, it's good to see people in the chat there. Mm -hmm. I would say I probably uh, would be green. Reaper tries to be as green as possible here. Mm -hmm. Also really quick for anyone that's watching, Whenever I'm speaking, is it switching the view to just the black screen and Reaper Classroom 3? OK, sorry. Um, I got that comment last time, and I don't know how to turn that off on my end. Mm -hmm. I'll just speak as soon as you stop speaking and then switch it back to. Mm -hmm. there go. OK, oh, there so, go. so for some of you, it's holding you in place, or it's holding him in place. OK. How's everyone doing today? Good. Oh, we need some of that blending excitement. That's what it's all about. Let's see. I should, while I'm thinking about it here, we're getting started. I should grab a couple of minis out of the display case so we can talk about some blends. Wait, if it's 8 a.m. for you, Kyle, does that mean it's you're in Australia? Cool. Glad to see the international audience. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I had to pick something out of the display case that I'm allowed to show people because it's been released or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Dark Sword's been putting me to work lately. So, here we go. Got fun little chibis to talk about blending with. Yeah. Oh, the, the rack. Yeah. My wife was super sweet and, and let me like basically turn what we call the nerd room into a, a, a pseudo gaming store. I had so many things I started forgetting what I had and this has helped greatly. Can, can you guys see the shelves? Uh, it's probably the the best view I can give you guys I've got. And then that doesn't include the boxes of bones miniatures that I just have sitting around at the same time there. Too. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, once I got the shelves, then I started saving everything and it's blisters other before that things just went into the uh, uh, things just went into the little baggies and got hung up there. So yeah <laughs> no kidding that pirate ship is is a beast i'll have to uh, uh i so actually i keep all my i keep all my D, D terrain downstairs next to the next to the gaming table there so i've got to um i'm already out of space for terrain and that pirate ship would take up like an entire shelf for me hey hey claudio great to see you that's, uh, that's awesome uh -huh. cool Bon dia, Claudio. 
Let's go. So do most folks have your your minis? I wasn't lying when I told people all you need to do is wash them. And um, I it's like we'll base coat together. It it seems it seems odd, but uh, sometimes with blending, half the battle is just getting a nice consistent. The way that I do it is just getting a nice consistent base coat. I I've never been able to do like some folks that do the uh, uh, the perfect zenithal highlight and then one coat of perfect consistency paint over the top of that showing through. It's like mine is all brute force and it all starts from an opaque uh, opaque base layer. So we good. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and even if you if you don't have the mini in question, it doesn't matter. I just pick somebody that's got a fair amount of uh, cloak and folds there and everything else like that. It, just because those tend to, yeah, let's see. I'll switch over to the other camera when it's time to actually rock and roll. There we go. We got the painting, the painting rum and the painting bourbon are flowing freely at this point. Yeah. There we go. And there was a scotch a little bit higher up too. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> I got I, I I actually am really partial to mead, and there's a local meadery, so it's like they're they're hard to find. So whenever I it's like somebody's selling a bottle, it's like I'll take two, one for now and one for when I can't find it next. Yeah. Yeah, Greg. There these these bones four wizards are like ideal for demonstrating a lot of the stuff we have. So <laughs> we have all of them painted there. Cool. Well, we got three more minutes. We'll let folks keep on filtering in. Thank you guys for deciding to spend your uh, the first portion of your Friday evenings slash afternoons slash for our Australian folks morning with me there. So, hi, Robin. <laughs> Good to see you. So, there we go. If you guys have comments, you can either. Uh, I would make sure if you want everyone to see them, you can actually select all panelists and attendees just so everyone can see like a whole conversation rather than just messaging Ian and technically me. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Thanks for, thanks for saying. Yeah. Oh yeah, actually I need to make sure I'm, I'm sitting here, my chat would only go to there we go. All panelists and attendees. So. Cool. Let's see here. I'm going to swish my paintbrush around in some water real quick. I, I started breaking this paintbrush in at Reaper, ReaperCon online there. And this has been an unruly brush. It just, its bristles don't like to behave. So it needs a little bit more TLC before we get started with it. I'll show you guys this before, but I always I carry around my little paper towels and I make a little V and I sharpen up my paintbrush over and over again. It, it's funny because but paper towels are actually slightly abrasive. So over like a year of me doing this to a paintbrush, it will actually uh, shrink down and become a smaller paintbrush, just wearing away the tips of the bristles but it wears them all evenly so it stays stays sharp but it gets shorter and shorter as time goes on mm -hmm. there we go. all right just about a minute left here we'll get rocking and rolling cracking open the wet palette one more thing for everyone. There is a new poll this year in every single class. Don't forget to vote on that poll by end of class. And yes, Gary, licking your brushes might actually increase the longevity of the brushes. I, I don't know. I have not tried. <laughs> cool. All right. That is six o'clock. So. Uh, oh, David, if uh, if you do have Ghost White somewhere and can't find it, um, I would, if you have Vampiric Mist, I would grab that one. Otherwise, if you have any Reaper Off-White, you're going to be doing well there. So, cool. Right. Oh, uh, Factory White. I think Factory White is a grayish white. That should probably work pretty well, too. 
there. All right, cool. Well, hello everyone. If you've tuned in this class, you probably have seen my name attached to it and know who I am already. But just in case, I'm Ian Marcon, uh, AKA Kuro Clean Brush on uh, a lot of the, well, just on Facebook and a lot of the other miniature venues. And uh, I'm here today to teach you one of the many, many possible methods of blending. Uh, it's hard to actually really put a good name to this because different painters will call this type of blending different things. I tend to call this layering and feathering because sometimes if you just say layering, people get the connotation that you're not actually blending the layers together. But sometimes when you say feathering, people think that you're placing down a layer of paint and then taking a wet brush and going back over the edge uh, of that layer to uh, smooth it into the next. I mean neither of those things. I mean that we're going to layer the paint in a feathery motion such that it blends evenly. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about and you've never heard any of those conflicting ideas for what uh, that blending terminology means, don't worry. We will uh, we'll cover it all as we get rolling here. But um, with that, I think uh, you guys have all figured out the chat function already. I will try to be monitoring that to answer any questions that I can, but we should uh, we should start rolling here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch to my actual painting work desk uh, view and you guys can uh, you'll keep an eye on that and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So let's see here, screen share. Let's give that a go. Can everybody see my nice little Reaper U paint mixing palette? Awesome, thank you guys. Okay, so today I am going to be working on one of the Reaper Bones wizards. I picked this guy just because he has tons of folds in the cloaks. It actually turns out that blending a cloak is one of the harder things that you can do. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily, if you've never practiced blending before, take this miniature, work on, work on the cloak and get you know too bent out of shape if uh, at the end of the day, your cloak doesn't look awesome. The reason I pick a cloak is even though it's hard because of the sheer amount of surface area to do the blending, it's also somewhat forgiving because it gives you a lot of space to work with with your brush and to see what I'm doing. So we have to strike that balance. A couple practice runs though, and you should be good to go. So uh, Erica asks, will cyan work in place of void blue? So I'll cover my paints here in just a second and why I made the decisions that I did. Um, but I'm not familiar with cyan off the top of my head. Void blue just needs to be darker than your middle blue and lighter than whatever your darkest color is. Any color that you pick, you could even use a purple. Actually a purple would work very nicely in this case, as long as it was a darker purple. So, okay, all right. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about blending? Well, when I'm talking about blending, what I am talking about is taking different colors um, or the same color and progressively, working, let's me, let me get my uh, paintbrush working like a pointer again. There we go. So like in this case, I blended purple. I took dark color in the recesses. I moved through a mid purple. I got lighter and lighter and lighter until on the very end of her little battle dress here, you can see some white, did the same thing over here. Uh, she's got some purple non or some pink non-metallic metal. That's all once again, just blending. You just change where you put everything. Uh, what model is that? This is an old uh, Super Dungeon Explorer, Soda Pop Miniatures, Ninja Division, um, I think Silver Paladin was her name there. And okay. And yeah, just where we're creating color gradients, generally from dark to light or light to dark, doesn't really matter. That is blending. If we make it smooth, we've blended it. If we haven't made it smooth, well, we're just layering. So, all right. That's kind of what we're trying to go for. But to be perfectly honest, this is slow. This We're not going to create this in uh, our two hour class. So what we're gonna try to do today with the time that we do have is we're just going to try to work on a portion of this wizard's blue cloak. And you may get farther than me. I may get farther than you. Don't sweat how far and how much of the cloak that you get. 
Um, I'm going to start base coating and see about how long I think it's taking me to get over various portions of this cloak. Some of you are going to feel compelled to paint the entire cloak blue, and then you're going to try to follow me step by step by step. And uh, uh, but doing everything, and you'll probably fall behind. So while you have complete artistic freedom to do whatever you want at home while you're following along with me. I encourage you to, if I stop at a certain point, probably don't go too much further than me, just so it makes it easier for you to stay caught up. Uh, Chad asks, how long did it take me to paint that miniature? Ooh, I painted that one like four or five years ago, so I'm forgetting. I do remember it took me eight hours to paint her hair. So it was not a short, it was not a short process and the metal probably took a long time as well. But okay, so we got our mini. We got our brush, or well, actually, let's talk about our brush. Um, when you're doing blending, you don't want to pick a brush that is really, really, really small because you want to be able to keep a little bit of paint on that brush. So I like to use a Raphael 8404 size zero. Many of you guys probably are familiar with Da Vinci or Windsor or Newton. Those paint brushes run at a slightly different size than the Raphaels. So many people who like, uh, like those like to run with a size one brush. But to give you an idea, if you don't have one of those brands of just how big this brush is compared to the miniature, this is what we're talking about. It's probably three quarters of the way across the midsection of this miniature. And the reason that we pick a brush this size is because the brush, it comes to a nice fine point, right? So that we can do some detail work, but it also has what is known as a fat belly, a reasonably fat belly. So the belly of the brush holds additional paint, holds additional water, and just it's like a bigger magazine on our, you know, uh, miniature painting assault rifle here. It gives us uh, more space to work with. And you might decide you need the drum magazine, in which case go with a, you know, size one or something like that. So, oh, cool. Thanks, Olaf. I'm glad that the uh, webcam is looking good for you here. So, cool. All right. So we've got our brush. You only need one brush. If you want to grab an even bigger brush, just to slap down the base coat, feel free. I don't like sw swapping brushes, so I'm just going to use this one throughout. Um, we've got our mini. We've got our paintbrush. Now let's pick our colors. A lot of people place, place a great deal of stock in exactly what colors you're using, but it doesn't matter. It, um, all you need to do when you want to pick colors that'll be easy for you to begin blending with is just pick a color that is kind of medium in, in the gray scale. So uh, this is a nice medium blue. It's a, maybe a little bit on the light side. I'll flip it upside down so you can see the color swatch. This. Uh, this blue has a lot of colors that are going to be darker than it. And it also has a lot of colors that are going to be lighter than it. And that that's big for us because it makes it choosing the rest of our colors easy. So once you got your middle color, you want to go ahead. And I would suggest grabbing at least, um, at least a couple more colors on each side of it. Now, when I paint, um, I'm full disclosure. I'm an engineer by trade. I tend to be a little bit formulaic in how I do things. And so one of the formulas that I've worked out through the years is that uh, I like to pick a line, a Reaper liner color, in this case, blue liner. And I like to pick one of the Reaper off whites, in this case, ghost white, because they're both, you know, blue colors. And then I use that liner, that darkest dark and that highest highlight for everything on my entire miniature, even if they're not blue. So I, if I was painting a miniature and I had like some leather on them, and so we're talking brown, if I had picked to use the blue liner as the deepest shadow on my browns, or uh, sorry, on my blues, I would also use that blue liner as the darkest shadow on my browns. Same thing with the ghost white. If I had picked ghost white to be the highest highlight on my blues, I would also make it the highest highlight on my browns. The reason I do, oh yes, you can use, uh, Claudio, you can absolutely use brown liner for a red cloak. That would, that would work awesome. So uh, the trick is that your liner color is very close to black. So it having a little bit of color in it is not gonna throw anything off. And same thing with your off-white, it's pretty close to white. So it having a little bit of color is not gonna throw anything off. And the real reason I do this is that if you use the same deepest shadow and the same highest highlight, for everything on your miniature, then it looks like the miniature is in a consistent lighting environment. It looks like the same light is hitting every portion of that miniature. Uh, there was a, oh, let me show you guys something real quick. I just thought it. So this is a miniature that I didn't do that on. And then Derek Schubert,
Derek Schubert gave me some critique on that miniature and I learned a lot from it. So this miniature was circa 2014 or something like that for me. And I need to move these otherwise I can get a little farther down. But the trick is on the gal, I used brown liner for her deepest shadows. And I used like a yellow off-white for her highest highlights because she was warm tones. I thought that that would work well. But then on the guy, I used blue liner for his deepest shadows and ghost white for his highest highlights. He looks like he's practically ethereal. He doesn't look like he's being hit with the same light that the girl is, is using. So um, Derek Schubert suggested that I use a consistent highest highlight or a consistent deepest shadow to make it look like I have the same light hitting all portions of my miniature. So for this practice miniature, I picked a blue. Heck, why don't we shade with a blue and highlight with a blue? But if I was in the middle of a miniature that I was working on and I already had other colors out there and I had already picked other deepest shadows and highest highlights, wouldn't matter if they were slightly yellow, wouldn't matter if they were slightly brown, wouldn't matter if they're slightly red, I, no matter what, I would keep using those colors with the mid-tone blue. Uh, did I use brown liner in all the shadows of the girl, even the green cloak? Ooh, that I painted it like six years ago. I don't remember that. I don't remember if I used it specifically on the green, but I, I would guess so, yes. Um, cool. Past that, I picked a darker blue because it's a nice even step in between these two. And I picked a lighter blue. It's probably closer to this guy than it is to this one, but that's okay. We'll, we'll make them work together. You could do this whole process with just these three paints, but this will save you a little bit of headache and I don't really like to mix paints. So it'll, it'll help us out here. Now, if you're, just, if you're just learning and you're like, well, are, they, are these colors gonna be appropriate with each other? I like to flip all the paints upside down like this and look at them side by side. And you can take a picture of them with your phone and then you can put a grayscale filter on it and if that grayscale that grayscale filter needs to show you that you're close to black on this side and close to white on this side, and that you go through even steps of gray. If you see something where, and sometimes this is hard to tell, especially if you're mixing different colors, but if you see something weird where it's like, uh, uh, where you see like black, lighter gray, darker gray, light, light again, that means that the colors have probably just confused your eye and uh, you might need to look for a different color in order to make that happen. So cool. Um, Rob asks, what does liner mean in terms of Reaper paint? Is it a special type of paint or just a name? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Reaper has their liner line and uh, of paints. The liners are very dark um, paints, but they also have a tad bit of flow improver in them. So they, uh, they're really nice for flowing into those deepest recesses of the miniatures for the shadows. I like them because they're nearly black and they're a dream to paint with because they've got a little bit of that flow improver with them. So I use a Reaper liner on essentially every, every single miniature I paint. I just vary whether it's brown liner, blue liner. Uh, I, I own red liner. I pretty much only use blue and blue and brown liner for being honest. Um, Oh, Dicey S says they also have a different base than the other paints. Well, whatever base they have, I love it. It works awesome. Um, yeah, uh, Thomas says it's a classic illustration thing to push your shadows cool if the highlights are warm and vice versa. Uh, yes, you can very easily say, hey, I'll use uh, blue down here and I'll use yellow up there. But cool. Well, anyway, we're 15 minutes in and we picked our paints. We picked our miniature. We picked our paintbrush. Now let's do what you all actually came here to see in the first place, and let's uh, power into some real painting here. So go ahead, clear off your painting area, grab your miniature, and let's grab your tropical blue. I, like I said, I'm an engineer, I'm pretty formulaic, so I'm going to kind of show you how I prepare my paint palette. If you follow along, you might learn a cool little trick that helps you spatially separate your colors so that when it gets really hard to tell, well, uh, which exact color you've got on your paint palette. Um, by spatially organizing things on your paint palette, you can keep things, you can keep things straight in your head. So I'm going to take my tropical blue, so my middle blue, and I'm just going to put a drop. Oops. Well, it was a little bit clogged, but there we go. Uh, on 
the, in the middle of my paint palette. Uh, I put it higher up, so I've got a little bit more space, but just put it somewhere in the center left to right on your palette. Now, I don't want to base coat my miniature with the paint straight out of the bottle, because if I did that, it would be a little too thick. So the way that I like to water down my paints is I take my paintbrush, I dip it in my paint water, I get a little bead of water, and then I work that into my pool of paint towards the edges. I'm also going to scoop out that chunk of dried paint. This, how much water you need to add is going to vary depending on what your, what size your brush is, how much water you picked up when you put in, uh, how wet your sponge is on your wet palette. If you're using a dry palette, all these other different things. But the one really good way that you can check to see if your paint is a good consistency for working with is you can take this little blob and you can pull legs out of it like an amoeba. And you can watch your little amoeba legs. If your amoeba legs shrink back on themselves slightly, but don't instantly break into little beads, you've got some paint that's gonna be some pretty good consistency for a lot of the stuff that we're gonna do with this. If the amoeba legs don't shrink at all, your paint is probably a little thick. That's okay with the base coat step, but we'll need it to be, but they'll be too thick for our remaining steps. And if the legs instantly break into a lot of little beads, then it's way too watery for what we're doing. If you find that uh, it's too thick, just add a little bit more water and mix it in. If you find that it's too thin, just add a little bit more paint and mix it in. You'll be good to go. So, okay, we've got our little amoeba. We've checked our consistency. Um, like I said, I've just, through trial and error, figured out, for me, it's about one brush full of water is what I need. Um, <laughs> yes, we can all say bloop every time I put paint on my palette. <laughs> okay, so let's grab, let's grab our miniature. And you see that arm? That arm is a beautiful arm because it's going to be really easy for us to figure out what's going on with that arm uh, in terms of shadows and highlights. I'm going to refocus here real quick. There we go. Hopefully it'll be a little clearer for you guys. All right. Load up your paintbrush. When we're base coating, I like to put about a third to a half of the uh, bristles in the paint. I don't wipe anything off. And we get down to business. So. Let's go ahead and really quickly just dab some paint on here. Like I said, I've done nothing special to this miniature other than just washing him. Let's get that arm. Let's get that folds of that cloak. It's probably going to need two, maybe three coats. Um, especially, you can paint straight over bones. They tend to have a couple areas when I do it that I didn't fully wash everything off of. And so it likes to fight me a little bit, but that's okay. We've got time. We've got time. Let's get all that covered up here. Let's put some in here. The nice thing about this is that it's a base coat. Nothing else is covered yet. We don't have to be too careful. I'll try to keep an eye on myself, make sure I don't start moving my hands too far away from your guys' line of sight here. Let's dab some blue in there. Like there, it's starting to separate a little bit. That just means that I didn't uh, scrub the uh, mold release out of that fully. Try to move from dry areas, uh, sorry, from wet areas to dry areas. Try not to go back over anything that uh, is half dry while you're doing this. Because if you do, you'll end up pulling up half dried bits of paint and those half dried bits of paint are gonna go texture uh, the miniature everywhere. So um, it's better to let it dry and come back with a second coat. All right, that's actually going to be a lot of area for us to work with. And I might just go that far because it's going to take a couple more seconds. Uh, please pull camera back. Mini isn't showing in frame. Anybody else getting that? If I leave it right here, is that perfect for everybody? Mm 
move about one inch up. Okay, good, very centered. Interesting, okay. I'll try to paint a little closer to the top for folks there. Cool, thank you guys. Um, while we wait for this to dry to get its second coat, I'm gonna splash some more paint on the back. Uh, and we'll go from, oops, I just said I'd paint more closer to the top and now I'm moving the miniature again. There we go. Cool. I love how uh, good the coverage is on these Reaper Bones paint. Like, don't get me wrong, my MSP uh, paints are still kind of, are still prized possessions, but I've moved to using almost only the Bones paints ever since that line came out. <laughs> I'm going to move the miniature I showed you guys earlier, or I'm going to sooner or later inadvertently just mush her face with the wet paintbrush, and that would be bad. Uh, my Tropical Blue Reaper bottle is completely jammed with dry paint. Would adding white to the Void Blue be a good alternative? Generally speaking, I would say that adding white to a paint is never a good alternative, not because it won't give you the color you want, but because it will reduce the saturation after the fact. So if your void blue is not, uh, sorry, if uh, if your tropical blue is jammed, do you have oceanic blue? Uh, do you have Templar blue? Do you have, um, I don't know. I would, rather, I would rather see you take your glacier blue or something like that. And then uh, take your glacier blue and add a little bit of blue liner to it. So it's it's generally more forgiving to darken the paints down and not lose vibrancy than it is to try to brighten paints up and uh, not lose vibrancy. Oh yeah, oceanic blue. I, I almost grabbed oceanic blue thinking it was tropical blue. Those two are super close. So, okay. Cool. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to call that a lot of surface area. There's no way we finish all of that to the level that we want in the time period that we've got. So um, the front is dry or nearly dry now. So I'm going to go back and put a second layer on it. When I do this technique, I want complete opacity. It uh, some of it is going to show through based on how we apply the rest of the paint. So I don't want to have to worry that the portion that's showing through might accidentally be showing the plastic or the primer underneath it. So let's grab a little bit more of this stuff here. He's got, we just need to like paint some yellow stars on him or something like that. And he'll be, uh, he'll look like uh, Mickey Mouse's hat from uh, the movie there. This wizard, he likes light blues. Sophie says paint stars on the mini. Yes. <laughs> if, okay, normally, you see how I can still see wet paint in this crevice? Normally, I would not touch this until that was fully dry. But because I don't want to let you guys, I don't want to keep you guys waiting here too long, I'm just going to lightly apply some paint and try to keep my new paint away from the still wet paint so that I don't disturb it and pull chunks of it up. That this is solely something that I would do to save time for interest of the class. This is not something I would do if I was painting um, at home with unlimited or semi unlimited time. Once this is kind of similar area, I gotta be careful. There we go. Now you may be through your second coat and you're like, darn it, needs a third. If that's the case, don't sweat it. it. Just means that your paint is probably a little bit more watery than mine. And if you're like, noob, why did you even need a second coat? Your paint's probably just a little bit thicker than mine, which is fine for this stage, but we'll need to, uh, we'll need to um, 
thin it down for the next stages. Uh, Claudio asks, how long would I recommend to wait between base coats? That is a tough question to answer because it's going to depend on the humidity of where you live as, where, as well as how uh, much you watered your paint down. Usually if I'm painting an entire miniature and I'm actually sitting there and taking my time instead of just kind of slapping paint on real quick as a base coat, by the time I finish that color, I'll be ready for the next, I'll be ready for the second uh, coat. If I would have wrapped the blue all the way around the miniature, this would have pretty much guaranteed been dry by that point. So I don't really think of it in terms of a time uh, allotment. I just say it's like, hey, um, I'm done now. Yeah, Jan says she can put a small fan on uh, on low and place it in front of the mini to help with drying time. That, that would certainly speed up the miniature drying time. I like to keep from having any air moving around me because then it also speeds up the drying time of the paint on my palette. But if you live in a wetter environment, that might be the only way to fly. Uh, do I ever use a hair dryer? Um, I do, especially for washes and glazes, but I don't keep it at my painting table. So I have to really be desperate to uh, speed something up for me to go all the way to the bathroom, fire up the hair dryer, and, and do all that stuff. Funny story, I was actually, I did just use a hair dryer today. I am uh, working on a a quick little, I play the Star Wars X-Wing game and I was working on a quick little X-Wing repaint. And uh, I painted this X-Wing, I, I cleaned this X-Wing up and I, 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 I botched one of the X-Wings halfway through. I didn't really botch it, I just, it was textured because I was trying to repaint something I'd already repainted. And so it was a little bit textured and I was like, ah, that's not going to work. So I had my, I had my airbrush out and I was like, darn it. I need to, uh, I need to hurry and get another X-Wing ready if this one isn't going to work for me. So I was rushing, rushing, rushing. And I, I was just washing and cleaning and, and gluing and everything, a new X-Wing. And, and I was going to bust it out. And I was like, well, I need to, I need to make sure all the water is gone. So I broke out the hairdryer. Well, it turns out that the guns on the X-Wing do not like the hairdryer. And I had like spaghetti noodle, um, x-wing guns in in a couple minutes they actually move towards the heat and so i had these curvy x-wing barrels all over the place and i had to i had to cut them off and replace them fortunately i cut i cut the guns off of the one where the ship was fine and the texture was fine but the uh guns were all messed or i cut them off of the one that the texture was bad on and put them on the second one there so uh, christopher says i live in colorado i have a hard time keeping it wet um I used to um, I used to live in South Dakota, which was absolutely bone dry. And uh, for me to keep paints wet on my wet palette, generally, if I just made sure that I had a little bit of excess water around, a little bit of excess water around the sponge, that would help me out a little bit there. Um, oh, thank you, Rob. I'm glad that uh, the class is, is helping you out so far. And that, that liner paint, I can't say enough good things about it. So, okay, are we ready to move on? Yeah, pretty, pretty close. Let's, uh, I'm going to slap another coat of paint on the back here. It's drying. We're going to let it finish its drying while we put some of the other, some of the other colors on our palette. And this is where I'll show you that, uh, um, that little spatial organization technique that I use. Oh, Casty, Yeah. If you're, if you're in Southwest Louisiana, yeah, your paints are going to be like wet for days I, I, you might want to take a wet blending class and see <laughs> see how that uh, see if that helps you out in your in your environment <laughs> so i know every time i go down to texas to teach my classes at ReaperCon, everything is oh sorry i'm drifting uh everything is uh much harder to do because it takes so much longer for everything to dry than I'm used to. And so it just throws me off my rhythm a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Thank you there, Robin, for catching my frame issues. Hey, uh, real quick reminder to everybody in the chat, make sure that when you're sending stuff in the chat that you have it listed or that you select at the very bottom where it says to all panelists and attendees so that everybody else can see what you're asking instead of just me alone. So cool. All right. This guy is looking pretty opaque for me. I think that's going to work for our next steps. So Greg says in lieu of priming, he likes to use a thin down uh, liner wash. I've heard that 
be very, very, very successful. I, um, I've never given it a, a real shot personally, but I know a lot of people find that excellent there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ali, I'm, we're, I'm excited to be painting together with people again here too. It's, uh, it's fun to be sharing this semi solo hobby with people there. So, okay. Miniatures looking good. Let's break out some other colors here. So we got our tropical blue, right? I'm going to put out all the paints that we need to shade next. The reason I don't put all my paints out at the same time is that I'm a pretty slow painter. So if I paint at my normal speed, if I put the highlight colors out there while I was working on the shading, my highlight paint would be dry or semi-dry by the time I got to it. So for the moment, I'm gonna forget that these exist. And I'm just gonna grab my uh, void blue and my blue liner. And we're gonna go ahead and put out little puddles of paint for us to work with. I am not enough of an artistic free spirit to feel confident uh, just plopping all these down and mixing freely all over the place to get exactly which color I want. So I do, I take the engineer route and I put numbers of drops of each color out there. So let's move on out here again. We have our tropical blue in the center. I'm gonna shake up my tropical blue and I'm just gonna put a little bit more paint in there just because I spread it out so much testing the consistency for you guys, I just like a little bit more paint there. Now I'm gonna take that tropical blue and I'm going to put one drop down below and to the left of my main drop, one single drop. Now I'm going to take my void blue, ta-da. Shake it up all good. And now in line with the tropical blue, but to the left of my tropical, my single dot, I'm gonna put a little pool. And now I'm gonna take and put one dot together with that tropical blue dot. And I'm gonna put one dot over to the left and below. Okay, follow me so far. Now, Let's see here. Now, go ahead and grab good old blue liner. Shake it up real good. And then put a drop of the blue liner in line with that top row and one drop with that single drop of void blue. So what are we doing? All we are doing is we're creating a couple little lines of paint where the top row is all of my straight out of the bottle colors and the bottom row is a 50-50 mix between the two adjacent pure colors. This helps me when my paints start to dry and some of them are drying faster than others because I've used more of, a, more of one than the other. This helps me very quickly figure out what color it was that I need to make more of and it tells me exactly the ratio of paints that I need to make that. So I've got this all set up. I'm gonna water down each of the colors. So remember, this is just a brush full of water. Work it in a little bit here. If you're unsure of the consistency, do that little amoeba leg thing, drag them out, see what happens. Um, I'm gonna skip that just because after doing this with this exact wet palette and brush for this many years, I know that that is exactly the right amount. Um, but if anybody wants, I can demonstrate the amoeba leg thing uh, once again there. Just let me know in the chat. And we're going to water this guy down and mix them up real good. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I am glad that my technique is making sense to my engineering brethren there. There we go. And then lastly, watering this guy down. So hopefully we should be able to look at all of those and see a smooth color transition from one side to the other. If you do not 
That's cool because I guarantee you, and we'll talk about how to fix that when we get to the highlights, because I have pretty much guaranteed that 50, 50 mixes are not going to work for the highlights. So we'll talk about how we fix things when we get in between those. But uh, for the moment, this looks really good to me. This looks like a nice smooth gradient between all the colors. These two may not play completely nice to each other, together, but we'll have to give it a try to figure it out. So we'll go there. I do have a question from Aaron in the question I say, when are you starting a weekly Twitch stream? <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I've been giving some thought to that and this was a big step for me because this was the first time ever that I was actually able to get the color balance right on my cameras. Funny thing was all I had to do was wear a white t-shirt. When I was showing up in all my black nerd t-shirts, it completely freaked out all my cameras and I couldn't get anything to work. So with that in mind, I may actually have the secret to high quality video that I can, uh, that I can do for you guys there. So, <laughs> cool. Oh, I'm glad there's Samantha. There, there. Like, uh, yeah, I use a size zero there. Uh, let's see who's asking about uh, David. Yeah, I use a size zero. Many people like to use a size one. Um, I wouldn't go much smaller than that, but you can go larger than that if you feel really good with your brush dexterity. So, okay, we got the colors and we got the miniature. What we need to do now is we need to start applying some of those shadow colors. So before we put any paint on this miniature, let's just think, where are the shadows going to be? Well, if I kind of tilt him on his uh, side here so that I, my light is coming very strongly from up above here, you can kind of see that well, this is going to be very uh, definitely highlight regions, very definitely highlight regions, but we're going to get into shadows very quickly down here, very quickly down here. We're also going to need to put some shadows in here in the crevices between what looks like his, I guess that's his cape. I guess I kind of painted his robes in his cape as if they were the same color, but who cares? For the purposes of demonstration, we're going to be good. So we can uh, put that in there. And then uh, Bryce, when am I going to pass my genius? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Bryce, I mean, you can kick my butt in painting any day of the week. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure you need my genius at the moment, <laughs> but uh, thank you nonetheless. Um, we're definitely going to want to shade in here uh, in the inside of the, the folds of the cloak. But I'm going to say that that bottom rim of his uh, giant sleeve thing is definitely going to catch some light. So bottom of here, in here, and then we're going to need to put some between the arm and the shoulder. Okay. And then these might be a little darker. So we'll think about this as we go along. Does the main camera look like a slideshow to anyone else? Uh, you guys will have to tell me if we start having some quality issues there. Okay, good. I'm glad we're still working. We're still rolling. Okay, so now what color are we going to start with? We're going to start with this guy because we place all this color down. We're going to take this 50-50 uh, this mix of tropical blue and void blue and we're going to start putting it in the position that it goes. But here is the first secret, so to speak, of the blending. Load your brush up about 30%, about a third of the bristles with the paint, and then take your thumb or take a paper towel or something like that and wipe some of it off. What you want to see is you want to see, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to refocus for you guys here a little higher. There we go. So what you're going to want to see is that the paintbrush bristles glisten with the color that they're loaded with, but I don't see paint on the outside of the bristles. If you see paint on the outside of the bristles, you have too much for this technique to work. Um, if it, it's if you, but don't worry on the other side of things. If you pull too much paint off of your brush, you're just not really going to leave much on the miniature. So you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot if you pull too much off. Um, but just try to make sure that you don't see paint on the outside of the bristles. Now, if I, since I'm painting here um, and I wiped all that paint off, there's not as much paint on this. It's already starting to dry on me. And I would not then take this paintbrush, having let it dry for all this time, and put it on the miniature. So I'm going to set my mini aside, swish my paintbrush in some water, clean it off. I like to make a little V with my fingers and pull my paintbrush through my paper towels getting it to this nice wicked sharp point if I do it right. There we go. Turn it to the side so you guys can't see those two little fraying bristles on the, on the end. 
Um, cool. Reload your brush. Grab that 50-50. Wipe it off on your thumb. Pull my thumb into frame here. I'll get a rainbow colored thumb before this is all done. And let's start applying it to the miniature. Now, if I just block it in, do you definitely see a transition between the blue I have and the blue I just put down? Hopefully my color fidelity is strong enough that you guys can see, yeah, clearly those are two different colors and there's no blending going on there. Okay, good. Yeah, it's very noticeable. So here is where we're gonna start using some, some fancy painting magics here. So go ahead and clean your paintbrushes off again. This is why they call me Curl Clean Brush. I'm always cleaning my paintbrush. So clean your paintbrushes off again. And let's reload. Reload your paintbrush, wipe some of it off. And now this time, instead of brushing your brush like this, take your brush and pull it from the highlights to the shadows and kind of use a jagged motion. We're starting to make a blend. Can you guys see that a little bit? We're starting to one. There's a little bit, there's still a little bit that's uh, not quite working, but we're starting to make that blend. Um, it turns out that these two colors are actually a little further away from each other than I gave them credit for. So they might need a half and half mix, but that's okay. The cool thing about this technique is we have all the time in the world. It's not like wet blending. It's not like uh, anything else. Um, it's not like two brush blending. It's not like any of those techniques that have a time limit on them. If we don't like our blend, we let the paint dry and we just grab a new color and, and we, we fix it up there. So I'm ho I hope uh, I will make mistakes while I'm doing this. Um, I'll, I'll make them automatically and I'll go back and show you guys how you fix your mistakes with your blending there. Uh, Kyle asks, is this like glazing where you pull the paint pool to the shadow or the highlight? This is very similar to glazing. You're just kind of doing it with a more opaque paint. Uh, Claudio, can I repeat that step? Don't worry. I'm going to repeat this step over the entire miniature with every single one of these colors over and over and over again. So you guys will get lots of opportunities to see this. So I'm going to grab that 50-50 uh, Void and Tropical again. And I don't, I'm not going to, I'm going to finesse that edge a little bit here. And I'm going to go around his, I'm going to go around his elbow and I'm pulling from the mid-tone towards the shadows. I'm just popping that in there, put a little bit, a little bit up there. And then once I've got away from the edge I need to blend, it does not matter how I want to apply the paint. So I'm just gonna, just gonna grab it, slap it on real quick because it only matters how I apply the paint at that blending edge that I wanna hide. So there we go, we're starting to get there, right? Okay, I'm gonna clean my paintbrush and I'm going to mush some paint in up here. Now, the thing that I just painted was awesome because it was easy to reach. This area is not easy to reach. It is not awesome. So I just have to do the best that I can. I'm just gonna dab some paint in. And I'm maybe gonna pull out the edges a little bit towards those folds of the cloak. Don't worry about this one too much. We're going to fight this area mostly with highlights. Having a time, a tough time reaching this around the camera. There you go. Yeah, close enough. Just mush some of that paint in there. We'll um, we'll hide it later by going back and fixing it with our midtone. Okay. Now we need to put some paint in this deep shadow. Now what I'm going to say here is that when we're looking at them from the front this portion of the cloak, uh, this, it would probably be somewhat light. So I'm gonna create a gradient from dark over here to light over there. Now, once again, I can't physically turn my brush like this and pull from the light to the dark because this raised portion is in the way. So I'm gonna pull from the light to the dark from the midtone to uh, the shadows, but I'm just gonna do it with my paintbrush on its side a little bit, so. We're going to make little, little strokes like that. Want to make that edge all nice and jagged. Now, if you haven't pulled enough paint off of your paintbrush before you go to put it down, this is going to be extra hard for you 
to hide that, uh, hide that transition. So make sure you're removing enough paint. Okay. Once we get past the edge that matters, we can just paint it in opaquely. We don't have to worry. Uh, there we go. Hopefully you guys can see. Cool. All right. So we've got some darkness. I seem to have missed an area up here. So I'm just going to real quickly put some back in that area. Now, depending on your colors, you might have to do a couple layers of the shadow, but we'll start, start making some progress here. Now, I'm reasonably happy with the blend down here. It turned out pretty okay. I am not reasonably happy with the blend up here, right? So let's go ahead and fix that. I'm going to swing our palette back into view here. All right. This was the color I was trying to paint. This was the color that was already down. So these two are the paint colors that are not cooperating. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take a brush full of this guy, plop it down, take a brush full of this guy, plop it down, mix them together. I seem to have accidentally got a larger brush full of that one. So I'll go back and do that. And I'll just mix them back and forth like that until I get a color that looks to me to be somewhat in between the two of these. Once I have that, I'll clean off my paintbrush. I will go grab said color, wipe it off on my thumb so that the bris bristles, bristles glisten, the bristles glisten. There we go. And then I'm going to go to the offending area and I'm going to make little back and forth wiggly lines. I'm going to go, you can make the noises at the same time. It will aid in the technique. So don't be afraid to make the wiggly line noise. The, oh, I can't speak. The wiggly line noises. There we go. And just do that over the offending boundary. And then suddenly, wow, we have nice smooth transition here. Am I touching down to up or just up to down? I am touching both directions. I'm going on the surface. Thank you. I'm going to grab a little bit more of that little stuff and I say, this is a good color transition, but it could be a better color transition. And I'm going to go over the edge and I'm going to wiggly line. And now, hey, we're starting to do, we're starting to be pretty good here. Um, I'm going to ignore this area for the moment because we're going to be able to fix that in a slightly different way. All right. Let's grab another color. Now, this is your first time doing this technique. You are going to wiggly line and you're going to put down a third stripe and you're going to be like, well, fat lot of good that one did me. Do not worry. It will click with you with a, uh, with a couple <laughs> the, the, the cats like in the, the, my wiggly line noises. That's awesome. Um, when you put down that third line, the way to make it blend the two colors in is to make sure that you've taken enough off on your finger and that you got an amoeba. I need to pull this and it gradually shrinks down instead of immediately breaking into uh, immediately breaking into beads. If it immediately breaks into beads, you'll probably get little coffee stain effects uh, instead of actually covering up the boundary. And if it doesn't break into beads at all ever, if it doesn't shrink down or anything like that, then you're just going to leave a third darkly colored line. So the trick with this is to really learn how much to take off on your finger and then to use light pressure and little up and down wigglies. Okay. That went pretty well. So let's go ahead, come back to our, come back to our paint, grab this void blue. So let's get void blue on our brush, wipe much of it off and go back to here. So now what I want to do is I just want to go further down the gradient that I want to create. So let's say there. And I want to pull from the mid-tone towards the shadows. 
I'm reaching up a little bit further when I get to one of those deeper, deeper folds there, right? Just move your way across. I'm gonna reach up in there really good because that would be really dark. There we go, we're making some progress. Now, what's interesting is that you'll, you might be able to see that my blends got better as I moved across the miniature. That's actually because I had too much paint on my brush. And I, as I was slowly started using up the paint on my brush, it got better and better. Uh, Marie asked at the end of the workshop, can I post a higher resolution photo to Discord? I can certainly do that. I will, I will do my best to give you guys there something, something like that. So, okay. Not bad. I'm actually going to grab a little bit more of it and I'm going to wipe most of it off. And I'm not fully happy with this. So I'm just going to lightly, lightly brush the edge. And this time I'm only pulling downward because I'm still just using the darker color. That kind of worked. So we'll probably have to make a, uh, a uh, half and half mix between the two of those and you do wiggly line again. But that's not the end of the world. That's just how this works. Let's, uh, let's grab a void blue again and let's just finish off everything below that transition line. I have to load my brush a couple times. And one of the interesting things with this technique is that it gets easier the more transparent your paint colors are. So believe it or not, the colors that are harder to paint naturally because they don't cover anything, like your reds and your yellows and some of your lighter skin tones, actually easier to blend with a lot of the time because they don't cover anything. Now they can be difficult to highlight, but they can make a lot of the shading, uh, they, they can make a lot of this depth easier. Let's see. I'm gonna just lightly touch up that boundary. There we go. Let's uh, let's put some here in that deepest fold of the cloak again. So once again, I can't reach it, so I'm going to have to draw from the side. I'm going to I can't I can't reach it like this, so I'm going to have to draw from the side. I won't make this area any darker than I did previously because it's still fairly light facing. So as I go highlight everything else that's going to be enough darkness for that area. How do I know that? Through trial and error. I just, just practice. There's no magical formula on that one. And there's many different ways to skin that cat. So, or as one of my old professors used to say, many routes to Dairy Queen, if you prefer that to cat skinning. So, okay. Just brush to the side, brush to the side, brush to the side. I'm making a mess on the other side of the cloak, but that's okay. We'll fix it. This is a very, this technique is a very much, you take two steps forward and one step back, and then you just keep doing that long enough that you've made the journey. This is a tough thing to reach with the camera like there. I'll try that. Yeah, that one's definitely going to need some wiggly line in between all that there. How's it coming for folks so far? What questions do we have? Can I show the palette? Well, wow, that was exactly what I was going to do. I'm actually going to grab a brush full of this, plop it down, grab a brush full of this, plop it down, mix those two together. I've got my 50-50. I'll use that to do wiggly line in between the offending colors. So I'm loading up with that little half tone that I made. And now I'm going to do wiggly line. We go. We're starting to make that transition go away too. Uh, can I show it? Go ahead, guys. 
I can explain the mix on the palette again. Yes, I can. Before I do that though, real quick, let me take that little transitionary uh, amount that I made, made there and I'm gonna wiggly line this area. Just back and forth, back and forth. We're starting to make some things go away. Notice what a, a hash I made of this side of things. That's okay. It's just paint. Let's grab the midtone, clean that up so it doesn't have to bug us ever again. Can't hurt us anymore now. We're free. There we go. Cool. David says he's getting bathtub rings in the crevices. Suggestions. So what this probably means is that either your paint is too thin or you are potentially, uh, so when I, when I clean my paintbrush, if I were to put this paintbrush in my, on my palette, I would water down whatever I was picking up. So I wick the majority of the moisture away and now I have a relatively dry paintbrush to go grab it with. Uh, one of my buddies, I was teaching him this technique and I couldn't for the life of me figure out why it wasn't working for him because he was watering down the paint like I told him to. And then I finally realized that he just was using a sponge to wick off his brush every time. So his brush was twice as wet as mine was. If that's the case, and if that's how you like to clean your paint brushes, then all you really need to do is just leave your paint puddles a little bit thinner knowing that, or a little thicker, sorry, knowing that they're going to get thinned down by what's on your brush. Um, so by using your wiggly lines, you are feathering to avoid any straight line for the eye to follow. Yes, Robin, this is very much like camouflage. If you have a bunch of different shapes all together, they can break up the silhouette of something and they can, uh, they can disguise it to the eye. We're just doing wiggly lines to have different colors break up that nice, crisp transitionary line that the eye is so good at catching. And then Claudio, I hadn't forgotten about you going back to here. This right here in the middle, tropical blue. This to the side, void blue. This at the very end, blue liner. In between them, I have one drop of blue liner, one drop of void blue. We just grabbed the adjacent colors, did one drop of each. This right here, one drop of void blue, one drop of tropical blue. Just grab the adjacent colors, one of each. Okay. So our little wizard, he's starting to show some shading here. I'm still not 100% happy with that blend. We can go back and we can fix it, but we, that's the trick with blending. You can go back and forth making wiggly lines all day long until you have the most pristine blends uh, ever seen. And you'd probably do that in a competition piece. Or if you're like, I'm painting this for my D&D group and none of them are painters and they won't care if the blends are perfect or not, then uh, just get it close enough and move on. So how much time you spend depends on the final, the final goal for that miniature. So, okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit darker here still though. So I'm gonna go ahead now, I did the last step with this pure void blue. Now I'm gonna use 50-50 void blue and blue liner. Take it off on your um, thumb again. And this is getting really dark. So I'm going to go most of the way down on the sleeve at this point. And I'm going to draw from the lighter towards the darker. And there we go. All right. We made that boundary really nice. Oftentimes it gets easier to do the blending as you're getting towards those darkest colors. Because I would say that doesn't need a wiggly line. We're good to go as is starting to make some really dark color transitions. And then I'm going to take that same mix that I just used once again, loading it up, taking some off, and then going into the folds of the cloak here. Just little, little hashes, little. There we go. And then that is hard to reach camera in the way, but you'll forgive me here if I cheat with my brush angles. There we go. Trying to make that all dark. I'm actually going to extend that out a little bit at the bottom. 
I just it's so hard to reach with the camera there. There we go. Oh, if I only know how to paint competition quality. That's why I haven't finished anything. Totally understand, man. I had not, I had not ever managed to paint an army until like a couple of years ago. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I gotta, I'm never, I'm never going to have any painted Dungeons and Dragons miniatures or army miniatures unless I learn to sacrifice a little bit. <laughs> and, that, and even so I'm, I'm begrudgingly learning, uh, learning some of that. So, okay, still drying off the paintbrush here real quick. I don't need any wiggly lines. That looks great. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab the blue liner or darkest color. And then on the very bottom of this sleeve, we're going to blue liner it. As Homer Simpson once said, dough. Let's see. Yeah, Peter, you can start with the shadow and move all the way up, but you'll it you'll it'll take more coats to make things brighter. It's easier to move, it's uh, easier to cover things if you move towards the shadow. So there you go. Now we've got a mid-tone to shadow transition. Hopefully you guys can see that a little bit. This is bugging the heck out of me. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab um that mid-tone again. Yeah, it is very easy to correct this way. Um, that's one of the beauties of this technique. Because I'm covering up such dark paint, I'm not taking any of the paint off on my paintbrush and I'm just mushing that over the top. There we go, getting there. Yeah, guys, do sacrifices are necessary to keep your sanity intact. Um, at this point, my paper towel is, I've used all the sides of my paper towel, and so it doesn't have much absorbency left. So I'm going to swap that out for another one here. You just that there. Okay. Now, um, real quickly here. So we've learned the techniques. We're at 7.03, so we're right on schedule. If we spent half of our time doing shading, then we can spend the other half of our time highlighting. We're doing really good. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend just a little bit of time darkening the inside of that sleeve so we can see how that works. Uh, David asks, in regards to terms, what's the difference between blending, layering, and feathering? So I touched on this, I think, it was either right before we started or right as we started. And really, that's a tough question to answer because different people are going to apply the terms differently. Blending is just flat out creating a smooth color uh, transition but, or a smooth transition between any colors, right? Um, that is at least agreed upon. But what you call the techniques that produce that, that's argued fairly heavily. Layering is where you take different paint colors and you apply them down, let them dry, apply, uh, uh, make another mix, apply that one, let it dry, make another mix, apply that one, let it dry. I, I would call what we're doing right now layering because even though we do some funky stuff with the uh, consistency and uh, feathering the edges of things, it's, it's still just a fundamentally uh, layering technique. I call it feathering because we are feathering the edges. Some people reserve the term feathering to mean specifically going back with a dry or a wet brush after you've applied your paint and then feathering the edge. It's, it's hard. It's not a 100% uh, agreed upon uh, terminology, but that's how I'm using it at the very least here. Okay, cool. To practice what we've learned so far, let's go ahead and do the inside of that sleeve here. So. The inside of the sleeve actually might be one of those rare instances where I don't go from the mid-tone to the shadows because I won't be able to reach things. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to go ahead and grab my blue liner and I'm actually just going to paint my blue liner into the deepest recess of the sleeve. So just after we just sat there praising how awesome it works to go from mid-tone to shadow, 
now we're going to kind of go from shadow to midtone here. But notice how I'm going to leave some areas uncovered because it's really hard to bring the brightness back up all the way. So I've darkened, I've darkened that area out. Now what I'm going to do, or I should ask, uh, let's, uh, I should ask a question here. And it'll probably be rhetorical so I don't make you guys sit there and have to type for too long. If I was to try to put this color down and this color down and this color down and this color and this color and this color and this color all to get back up to that, I don't know that even I have the uh, dexterity after practicing this for all that practicing this technique for all that time to fit every single one of those colors in this microscopic little sleeve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip this guy. And I'm going to just jump straight to here, straight to the void blue. I'm going to grab the void blue. And I'm just going to wiggly line the edges of that blue liner. Starting to run out of some on my brush. So I'll load it back up again and wipe, uh, wipe the worst of it off so the bristles glisten. And then keep there and just as best I can wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And load up some more on my brush. Wipe the worst of it off and wiggle line. Wiggly line, wiggly line, wiggly line. Get in a little bit more. Wiggly line, wiggly line, wiggly line. All right. Not have bad. Those two colors actually played nicely together. So now I will get to your second there or your question in one second there, Olaf. That is a good question indeed. So just like I skipped this one over and went straight to this one, I could jump straight back to this one, but I'm going to say if, hey, I had to do two half and halves, this one's probably enough of a jump. This is the one I'm going to use. So I'll wipe that one off on my thumb. And then I'll just wiggly line it again. And what you'll see is that in these really small spaces, they're actually much more forgiving than the very largest spaces, provided you have built up the brush control and dexterity necessary uh, to not splash too much paint outside of where you want it. There just flat out isn't enough space to make it uh, um, to require all of those colors that we just did. So we're getting it slowly but surely. And then I'm actually just going to grab my mid-tone again. So I'm going to grab that pure tropical blue, wipe some of it off on my thumb, and go back in and I'm going to draw. Remember, I don't need to do wiggly line here because this is my mid-tone. So I'm just going to draw from the colors that we're putting down, that we put down the shadows towards the mid-tone. And then I can't reach this super well, so we'll do what we can. I'm just tickling it with the tip of my brush, just leaving a little bit of paint behind, nothing too crazy. There we go. And what I would do here is because technically this sleeve is different from what's underneath it, I'd grab my blue liner and I'd actually just line that uh, the boundary between uh, the sleeve and the rest of the the rest of the cloak so that I can tell that it's different normally I would go back through and I would I would have had blended to this line but since I'm not painting this area yet I'm just going to draw the liner in to show you that the the sleeve is distinct from everything. Okay, Olaf says, thinking of buttery blends, who are my mini painting inspirations? Well, there are a lot of them, but I would have to say that one of the, uh, a couple of the painters who have been the most influential 
uh, in my painting journey so far are Rhonda Bender, because actually she taught the first ever um, blending class I ever took back when I took it in 2012. And the core, probably even more than the core of what you're seeing right now is basically just what I learned in her class. So her very smooth color transitions have been a big inspiration on me. Uh, Michael Proctor has helped me a ton uh, learning through that over time. Um, just there's a ton of the Reaper folks that have been excellent inspirations to me. Aaron Hartwell, Tish Bolter, Rex Grange. There's tons of great painters out there. I love to watch Scott the Miniature Maniac um, on YouTube there and see what fun stuff he's up to each week. And um, yeah, tons of good people out there. Thanks for asking. Okay. Taking a look at it. What questions do we have right now? Is it going okay? What are what are some problems people are running into? None. Everything's going perfect. Well, if everything's going perfect, well, let's grab some of our tropical blue, our mid tone, and go fix some of the sloppy mistakes that I made when I was working up here. I'm going to refocus things. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint on the tops of the folds with that tropical blue and just leave some of the dark in the recesses. There we go. That's for this area. As much blending as we need. Uh, for that. We're going to highlight it up even more. And then that little bit of darkness we added is going to look even darker. Okay. Christopher James says, I was having problems with blotchy paint, but it's I smoothed it out and it's mostly okay now. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Allie says, may have missed a step or two when I had to feed my dogs, but it's all good. Okay. Well, good. Hopefully we repeat every step that we're doing ad nauseum. This is not like a super complicated process. It's just doing it over and over and over and over again that produces everything there. Uh, Christopher, what color did I just use? I just used the mid-tone again, tropical blue. In fact, as long as your tropical blue is fair, is a little bit transparent, you can, if you need to make a transition to any lighter color, you can kind of cheat by just splashing your mid-tone, a little bit of your mid-tone here and there. Um, but save that one for uh, once, you've, uh, once you've got the rest of the technique down there. So, cool. All right. Let's start doing highlights. Generally speaking, highlights are harder than shadows. This is because the shadows already recede from your eye. They're already dark. You're not giving them a whole ton of attention, whereas the highlights are popping out at you and your eye is better at spotting issues with the color transition. Um, but that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna fight through everything and uh, we'll show you how to fix those mistakes. So, uh, Somebody said current issue is that the transitions are too stark. That will, um, if your color transitions are too stark and you haven't yet started having blotchy paint, then I would try watering down your paint just a little bit further or and or removing a little bit more of it on your thumb before you go back through the areas. And that'll help smooth, smooth things out. Uh, Henry says the blue liner looks a little chalky. Is it too watery or not enough water? What can, what can contribute to the chalkiness is if you're working back and forth over an area too long, too many times before just letting things sit and dry, that can contribute a little bit to the chalkiness. Um, but blue liner straight out of the bottle is actually pretty good at covering things. So maybe, uh, maybe take a little bit of blue liner straight from the bottle and only add the tiniest a bit of water to it and then just go back through in those areas. It's very vibrant. It can help you smooth out some of that chalkiness there. Okay, good questions, everyone. Let's do this then on the highlights. So grabbing our colors back out here, we got tropical blue, we got glacier blue, and we've got ghost white. And now my, um, I'm gonna have to refocus again, but um, these are the ones that we're gonna use for the transition. Now you can see that there is a large step between the ghost white and the glacier blue. So we're not gonna do a 50-50 between these two because we would just end up having to mix in between colors anyway. So I'm gonna to try to show you how to do a two thirds, one third, half and half, and then two thirds, one third. Um, if you get lost along the way, 
I'm more than happy to repeat it. It tends to happen in all the classes that I teach. So don't, don't stress, just ask me to repeat it if you need me to. So let's take these colors. Let's start putting them on our palette. Let's grab out tropical blue. If your tropical blue pool is still fine, don't need to add anything. But what we will need to add is we're gonna need to shake up our tropical blue and we're gonna need to add one single dot below the line of the main colors. There we go. Uh, here, let me let me reset my uh, let me reset my focus to a little lower. There we go. One little trick you guys might like is that to help your paint droppers not uh, not clog, I like to wipe off the tips in the paper towels and then making making a little shield so you don't blast paint everywhere. Lightly squeeze it until you can hear the air run through it. You'll bubble a little bit of paint out, but then the air the air that you're pressing through it will keep the uh, keep the dropper clear going forward. Okay, we put down the tropical blue. Let's shake up and grab our glacier blue. Now, we're gonna put a pool of pure great glacier. Oh boy, uh, this is you know how I just said that my technique will keep you from clogging your dropper bottles. Well, not a hundred percent of the time. So, I'll open that up for us real quick. my handy dandy reaper pokey tool or a paper clip or a tack, whatever you got to use. There we go. Perfect. Get a pool or a kidney bean, apparently. Put one drop here. Now, put two drops here. Move over, put one drop. Move over, put one drop. So two drops. One drop, one drop. I ran out of uh, real estate on my palette a little bit there, but that's okay. You can still keep things mostly in line. Now shake on up your ghost white. Yeah. Now get a pool of ghost white. Oops, I haven't used this one in a while. The pressure is a little different going crazy on me here. Okay, we made our pool. Now I'm gonna add two drops, one drop, one drop. One, two, one, one. So that at the end of the day, what I have made is a bunch of little paint pools where I have Pure, trop uh, pure glacier blue, pure ghost white. This is half and half. This is one drop of each. And then this one is gonna be two drops of glacier, one drop of ghost, ghost white. And then this one is gonna be two drops of ghost white, one drop of glacier. Give this technique a try, but if this is not your preferred way to organize paints in your paint palette, you are not going to offend me. But if a few of you find it helpful, I'll be really happy. So. It's out of water. Get that brush full. Mix it in. Go just to the edges, but not too much further because if you spread out the paint puddle too big, then it dries out extra on you. Clean your paintbrush in between each watering down. You get another brush full. Work it into things. You'll notice that I'm using my really nice Glinsky Sable brush for this. I'm not mushing the bristles bad enough that I ever have to worry about anything. They, uh, they hang in there. And then I don't have as much space to work with on this one, so I'm going to draw it up and down a little bit so it doesn't run into my other pools. There we go. And we clean our paintbrush once again. Now you will notice that this is a lot of time in, in uh, prep work and mixing paints. If that's not your thing, and you're more of an artistic free spirit, mix on the fly. But I like this because it sets me up for repeatable success as long as I do the same thing each time. Uh, Rob asks, do you find a benefit of wiping the brush on your thumb versus paper towel, or is it a habit? 
Um, I do in that your thumb is a little bit less absorbent than a paper towel. So I actually take off less paint. Uh, that makes it a little bit more reliable for me to remove only the amount of paint that I want when I wipe on my thumb. Uh, like James Wapple, another good buddy and inspiration of mine there, he uh, he wears like a cutoff sock or something. And then he's like doing this, but he's just, he like never cleans his brush. He's just like, it's like, we'll just add this new color. We'll just mix on the brush. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy business. I can't, I can't deal with that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, he would use like a sock. I've seen people use, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of people use their thumb, but there's, there's other ways to do it too. Almost there. I should have entitled this class, how to get paint out of your dropper bottles in the most, uh, fastidious way possible, but, uh. Uh, then I didn't figure anybody would show up. So, mm -hmm. all right. I can't remember if I added water to that one or not, but some, your whites can be a little bit thicker, so it's not going to hurt it if I get mine a little more watery than I thought that I needed to. Okay. Last time cleaning the brush, and now we're ready to rock and roll. We got all the paints. We got all the paints in the proper consistencies, and we've got a nice, smooth color gradient. This one still might fight us. Just looking at them, we'll find out when we put it on the uh, put it on the miniature. Let me grab a new paper towel, get a sip of water, and then we'll rock and roll. Okay. So, look at this miniature. The easiest thing to see that is going to be highlighted is the tops of his arm here. So I'm going to grab, remember this is my mid-tone, so I'm gonna grab my 50-50 mix between my mid-tone and my first highlight color, that is my half tropical blue, half glacial blue. Wipe some of it off on my thumb, come back in here. And now I wanna make sure I give a little bit of space. I don't want to completely butt up against where I started my shading. because I want to leave a little bit of the mid-tone. I don't want to completely accidentally erase the mid-tone. And then I'm going to draw towards, towards the highlight away from the mid-tone. And then I'm going to do the same thing, move in the other direction. I'm going to refocus here for you guys. There we go. Make sure you don't reach too far into those crevices. Leave, leave some shadows in there. I'm gonna take, wipe off on my thumb and I'm gonna start drawing upwards on these. This is not how I would normally hold the miniature. I would hold it like this, but I would rob you guys of your ability to see if I did that. So we're gonna try it this way. There we go. Now, especially when we switch, when we hold them down or we can see everything else, it should start to look pretty good. I'm gonna go grab my, my mid-tone again, and I'm gonna clean up again some of the mistakes I made down here. And then we're gonna start building the light out here. So I'm gonna clean my brush. grab the 50-50 tropical and glacier. And then this is nice because I can reach absolutely everything here. This is very easy to reach. So I'm gonna pull towards the highlight. Remember, it's only important to do the feathering motion at the boundary uh, between the colors you want to hide. And then once you've done that, like over here, up here, up top, there's no boundary. I just need some opacity. So I'm just going to be a little bit more messy and just get that color back in there. Oh, 
All right. You know what I want to do here real quick, because I'm noticing that I didn't give a very good distinction between where his uh, cloak and his sleeve occurred. We're going to uh, we're going to brush some stuff in there. Let's see, I've got another question. chat. I think a good reason to use your skin is also to see how it is covering. That's actually a really good point. And something I forgot to show you guys is this. So you see my fingernail? Your fingernails are awesome for this. So if you take a color and you wipe it off to where you want it to be, and then I'm gonna draw that color this way. Notice how when I put my paintbrush down, I only leave a little bit of the color, but when I pull it away, I leave a droplet of the color. That is what we are doing with our little like strokes. Not only are we breaking up the, uh, not only are we breaking up the silhouette by having a jagged line on things, when we pull up our paintbrush, we're leaving more paint at the end of the stroke. And so by doing that over and over again, we apply less paint on this side, more paint on this side, and it, uh, it helps be transparent where we need the blend and opaque where we're trying to layer that color in. Uh, to make his beard, Henry, Henry asks, to make his beard white and gray, would you use a similar approach with a couple of shades of gray? Yes, on, on basic level hair, yes, that's exactly what I would do. I'd just be like, eh, it's white, or, you know, it's, I'd paint it gray, and then I would just kind of like highlight the strands with white. Uh, the, there may not be enough space for me to need to do wiggly line or anything like that. I may just try to do some other things. If we're getting into the really complex how to paint hair, I actually paint hair almost like I paint non-metallic metal where you're really trying to like, well, this is almost black. And then we give like a shine of light here. And then, but if it's really white and gray, we can't almost go to black. So we have to go to really dark gray here. And it, it gets, it gets funky, but more or less, yes. Paint it gray, highlight it white. You'll be happy for your tabletop wizard there. Um, cool. Real quickly, I wanna fix this. So I'm gonna grab my blue liner and I'm gonna, go in there, try to lift it up so it's in perfect focus. I'm going to do that number real quick. Now, that potentially looks a little jarring. So we're going to go fix it with, uh, we're going to go fix it with our colors a little bit here. So We want to hide it, so we're going to go grab our mid-tone, our tropical blue, and I'm just going to dab that lightly, just dab that lightly. Just to make the line a little thinner, just to make it look a little nicer. Just lightly eat up a little bit of the boundary there. It'll look better as we go through the other things here. But it says, I got a lot of difficulty or difficulty finding where to light and where to shadow, specifically in parts of the cloak without so many creases. Any tips? So the short answer is it doesn't matter. Um, it mostly doesn't matter. As long as you pick something that in your mind is like, yeah, maybe it could work this way. And then you're consistent and you apply apply nice gradients. You're good. So if we look at this cloak, some people are going to approach this cloak and they're going to be like, well, his shoulders are closer to the light and they're going to highlight all up here and they're going to bring everything down to shadow and especially deep shadow in between these crevices. But some people are going to approach this and say, yeah, maybe, maybe I want to do it a little bit differently. Maybe you've only got a little bit of highlight up here, mostly mid-tone, then it gets really dark in the center, and then it actually goes out to its highest highlights on the edge of these cloaked folds at the bottom. Either of those techniques is perfectly valid, and as long as you create smooth color transitions, most people are going to say, oh, that's just how the light hit it. So don't be too afraid trying to figure out perfect light theory on this. Just pick something and blend, and as long as you're consistent, it will work out pretty well. So, okay, uh, let's get back to highlighting there. I got on a little bit of a diatribe, I'm sorry. So we use this color, it looked good. It didn't need wiggly line. 
So let's go to the next one. This is the pure great glacier blue. Remember to take off some of it on your thumb. Go back to the miniature. And then we want to go higher up still. We don't want to completely lose our midtone. We want less of this than we did the last color. Let's see what you can do. I'm not going to reach as far down on the folds. I'm going to start a little higher up. And I'm going to draw the paint up. I'm also going to go and grab that glacier blue again. And I'm going to pull, I'm going to, I'm going to reach about halfway down on this. And as you can plainly see, I was a little too ambitious there. There is definitely a demarcation line between those two colors. So, it's wiggly line time again. This color and this color are not playing nice. 50%, 50%, mix them up. Getting that 50 50. Now I'm going to turn my brush on the side best I can and wiggly line it. Better. Better, but not perfect. So I need more opacity up here. And then I would go back through and I'd probably wiggly line the next darker color a little bit further in there. But remember, we've only got 27 more minutes. So, and this is not going to be a competition piece for us. So not every blend has to be perfect. When you're practicing, um, just keep, just push it as far as you need to, then grab another miniature and start fresh. Uh, if you do this too many times, you'll start to build up some texture and it's going to be a little hard on yourself, but it takes, it takes a lot of layers, but it's often good to finish a miniature just to a good practice standard and then jump onto the next miniature. Uh, yes. If you take one thing away from this class, wiggly lines are the things you need to take away. David says, I'm picking up the paint that I'm trying to wiggly line against over. Is it still too wet? Yes. I would say that that is most likely your problem. Um, are you using blue or are you using a different color? Are you using the same blues I'm using? Because if you're using different colors, your more transparent colors are more prone to this and you might just have to do a, a multiple, a couple coats in that case. All right. We got to keep going. This wizard, he needs more majestic electric blue. We did this, it worked pretty well. We're going to move into the two thirds, one third. Same blues. Okay. Yeah. Then David, I would probably say that I would, it's probably just a little bit too watery. Um, you can sometimes get away with that too, just by using a couple different, uh, a couple different layers. Henry said, I'm still not sure what areas get what gradients that, that tripped me up a lot at the beginning too. I, I know I say it, it doesn't matter, but let's go. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about what you could do on the back here in a second. And, uh, um, and maybe that'll help some folks here. All right. I'm not necessarily trying to wiggly line this. I'm just running out of space because the highlights get smaller and smaller the further up we go.
don't and reach down don't reach down even further still start even higher up than you did last time in each of these folds just gentle light pre light pressure on that brush that's pretty bright right and it's starting to fight us a little bit on the edges so we're going to probably have to go through and wiggly line that one I'm actually not going to mix a half and half in this case. I'm actually just going to go back to the pure tropical blue for a second. Wipe almost all of it off. And then go to that edge and just tickle the edge. Tickle the edge. Tickle the edge and do that over and over again. Especially when you get to your really light colors that don't cover so well, sometimes you can get away without having to do full wiggly line. You can just kind of tickle the edges of things. Or you can just dab them. You're just applying the lightest traces of paint to things. Getting there. This area is a weird geometry, so it looks kind of stark. We'll, uh, we'll try that. Make it a little bit better. How do we know how much pressure to apply? Uh, practice. But um, that's a cheating answer. So I, sorry, I, I, I don't want to just tell you practice. Really, the, uh, the answer to that is that the harder you apply, the more paint you're going to leave. So the less paint that you want to go on the miniature, the more transparent you want it to be, the lighter you need to press. It'll take you a while to calibrate where that is for your paint. But if you want to leave more paint down, press harder. If you want to leave less paint down, press lighter. OK, let's do that uh, bright little cloak edge here. I'll often like, you know, call my parents or my brothers or something and talk to them while I'm painting. And if I get into the point where I'm doing something fairly precise, I start half holding my breath. And so my volume goes way down. I have tones like, hey, if you can't hear me all of a sudden, I'm just I'm just holding my breath while I'm painting here. Uh <laughs> yeah. So I started using these plastic cups there before uh, before a lot of the ergonomic painting camp, uh, um, painting handles were even available because and I, I one of the reasons I started doing it is because if I needed to um, drill into something, I have no compunction drilling into a plastic cup at, with a little pin through somebody's leg. And on my nice miniatures, I can't show you this miniature because it's still it's unreleased yet, but I can show you the cup The I just blue tack quarters on the bottom and it auto it auto writes itself and because it's wider at the base than the top it's really hard to drop these and accidentally uh let the miniature take a spill uh peter asks, do i ever wash with the mid-tone to smooth over the layers i do not but there's many painters better than i who do i do a very just um brute force method there uh yeah Let's see. Sometimes when I paint eyes with detail, I get dizzy holding my breath. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, a real danger in our hobby here, isn't it? Okay, I'm talking too much, painting too little. Uh, we did this color. Let's grab the next highest. This is the half and half. We are not going to need much of this. So go ahead. And just lightly apply it at the highest highlight point. Just keep working your way away from that mid-tone. Go higher still on the crevice or on the uh, folds. It's getting there. And then now what I'm going to do over here, I am out of real estate to wiggly line. So I'm just going to use the edge of my brush and I'm going to draw it down the fold of the cloak like that. Let's see if that makes it easier to see than the white and back, back, black background. Cool. Let's 
We've got one mix higher still. We use this one. Let's grab this guy. Now we're now we're playing with fire. This is really bright, right? And oftentimes you might want to stop a little bit sooner than this. Don't feel like you have to go from nearly black to nearly white. Depends on what you're painting, but try to try to push yourself a little bit and go a little bit further than you think you need to. I'm just gonna get the edges of that fold here with that whitest whitest of the mixes here. Let's get a teensy bit here. On that fold, teensy bit on that fold, teensy bit here, teensy bit there. Making some progress. <laughs> Thank you there, Alia. This is the the true pinnacle of uh, um, hobby handles. So, okay, now, oh, uh, sorry, real quick. Grab that same color that you had, the nearly white, but not quite white. And just start a little bit lower down on the fold of that cloak and drag it there. And now let's grab the white for the extreme. Uh, Rob says, what is it, or asks, what is a tip to prevent over highlighting? Sometimes my highlights get overpowered and look more like a stripe. This happens to me too. And what I will generally do is I will get to this, let's, let's put the white down there and I'll show you how I'm gonna correct a little bit of the overpowering there. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad there, Jeremy, getting to paint alongside your daughter is awesome. My oldest is uh, three and a half and I cannot wait for her to be able to paint with daddy here in a, uh, in a year or two here. So, okay. This is our bravery test, as Bob Ross would say. Take your pure white or your uh, ghost white. Just apply a couple of dots here. Almost five there. Okay, so good. I don't have that much longer to wait before my little one will be ready. And then here we go can barely reach that area. So I'm just gonna do that business. I'm, I'm pulling down this time just because that's the only way I can reach it. And now we'll take that highest, highest white, get the corner of that. And not bad. It's a little bit unsmooth at the highest highlights. So we need to fix that up a little bit. Richard, your oldest is five. Let her paint some cheap plastic toy. There we go. I, I thought I have so many extra bones. I have thought about it. I was like, ah, she can't hurt anything. Give her a paintbrush, uh, turn her loose. I'm sure I'll do it soon. <laughs> Still a little stark up top. Many painters would just apply that mid-tone wash. But uh, what I will generally go do at this point is... Um, it's more of a shaping than anything else. Let's grab that tropical blue. Let's grab that tropical blue. Let's just eat up a little bit of this white. Let's just eat a little bit of it up. Let's just eat a little bit of it up. Same thing over here, just eat a little bit of it. Grab that tropical, just eat a little bit of it. That white undercoat still shows through a little bit and can be more forgiving than you'd expect. So just eat a little bit of it up. Light pressure, light pressure. Just extending that a little bit. It's just a shaping process at this point. Now, Not bad for a first blush attempt. We might have to say, hey, we got to this point and I'm like, darn it, why did I put those highlights all the way at the top of this cloak? Because you can't even see them when you look at them like this. So maybe I would have moved the highlights down a little bit further. And then I would have just painted my mid-tone in there and kind of moved some colors around, did some cleaner lines there. Um, going on like that. Let's see, 
Uh, oops, some cousins doing some bones painting. It sounds good. Um, you might be hearing some of my children right now. They're not happy about bedtime there, it sounds like. Um, there we go. Eating the tropical blue. Very good. Or eating with the tropical blue. So very nice. Okay. We have 15 minutes left. You guys are talking heavily about where do I place highlights? Let's talk about this by quickly sketching some stuff in. First off, does anybody have any questions on this beyond just needing to practice it? If you do, go ahead and shoot them at me and I'll jump back and forth as I need to. But uh, om nom nom with the tropical blue. Yes, that is that is one of the ways to, to get things done. Okay, let's flip this guy over. Let's talk a little bit about how we could approach this. So, yeah, I can also, that uh, this is very true. Uh, my classroom overlord buddy here is reminding me that I can also, you know, jump into Discord some to ask or answer some questions after this or go a few minutes longer in this. So I'm around, please shoot me pictures of your miniatures on Discord. I will provide whatever feedback I can and just try to help out in all ways there. So, oh, the very bottom of his sleeve, highlight or leave as is. You're talking, you're talking this. Sorry, I just forgot. I would, let's, uh, let's quick and dirty grab the uh, uh, tropical blue. Light pressure, drag it down the edges. Maybe extend that up a little bit more. Tropical blue, and we'll grab the 5050 tropical blue and ghost white just because I am doing this in a hurry instead of doing it right. There we go. Now he's got a little bit more shape to that fold of the cloak there. Uh, Michael asked him, am I only touching the inside of the sleeve? I'm kind of touching the edge of the sleeve more than anything. So I'm just using the very tip of my brush. Um, if I have enough space, I can use the edge of my brush because then the edge of the brush lets the geometry of the brush work with you there. All right. Thanks there, David. Glad we had you with you with us there. Uh, Kyle, the invite to send minis for questions is the entire time that the Reaper uh, virtual event Discord is up. So from now to whenever they decide to take it down next week sometime there. So please, all of you, show me your stuff. I want to, <laughs> I miss physical Reaper Con where people bring me their miniatures. I look at what they're doing and I tell them specifically what can help them out. But I can try to replicate that a little bit if you guys send me some pictures. So cool. Back of cloak. We have a couple options. Option, one of our options is this. Is to put a highlight up here and then to shade down. Oops, I may not have enough blue left here. And so your shadows only exist in the recesses. And then the furthest that the tops of the cloak or the folds get is um, is just the mid-tone and everything. We splash all that in there. This is one potential option for how to paint this cloak. And if I just smoothed out my color transitions and I had mid blue in the middle here and I just made all this nice and gradienty, this would work out pretty decently. Or, um, let's see. Let's see. Will says issue with mixing the paints on the mini itself instead of the palette. I seem to get good results when I slap down two tones and start flailing a damp brush around. That is basically wet blending in a nutshell. So, <laughs> um, so there's nothing wrong with that, but that's pretty close to a, a slightly different technique. Uh, blending techniques are somewhat similar at the end of the day. They're just making sure you get, uh, you just gotta, 
it's just wiggly lines with different amounts of paint and different amounts of uh, uh, brush wetness and everything else like that. Yeah, Kyle says, uh, my problem with picking shadows and highlights are on capes like this. I usually just highlight the cylindrical high points and shadow the lows. Claudio says, I do the same. That is a really good point. I'm, I was thinking I would just sketch this out and then quickly uh, cover it back up, but I don't know that we have enough time for me to do that in a meaningful fashion. So let me grab a couple of miniatures that I painted and show you a couple of different ways to do the cloaks. Um, and we'll see if that works better from a teaching standpoint. Always got to clean my brush. I can't leave my brush unattend, uncared for for all this here. So let me grab some other stuff here. Okay. I had to think for a second. I think this guy has been released. If he hasn't, I hope Jim won't shoot me. Um, okay. This guy. This guy, instead of using like uh, grayscale, what I do is when I'm highlighting and shading red, oftentimes I just paint like purple in the shadows and then I just go up to more and more saturated red at the high points. This is a classic example of, I just said, if it's higher on the miniature, it is brighter. And then we just blend gradients accordingly. We're good to go, right? Uh, incidentally, if you can learn these blending techniques really well, non-metallic metal is very much just a blending technique with a little bit of light sourcing. So uh, you can move on to that. <laughs> Thanks there, Richard. I, I will, I am thinking about it heavily there. So, okay, we're gonna put this guy down. There we go. Okay, now this guy, it wouldn't make as much sense. Oh, this is a really hard one to show off with this light. He wouldn't make as much sense to say if it's higher, it's brighter because the higher it is, the more shaded it is by everything else that's going on. So I actually made lower down on all the folds brighter because they're a little bit more slanted towards the light. Um, and this, I, I did a very similar thing with the red. Uh, this is actually the first miniature I tried that on. So I got a little bit better by the time of the dwarf, but it's purple in the shadows and then uh, just saturation there. Um, and then this guy, we got another cloak here. This guy had to do something kind of like a mix of both because I wanted to give him a color transition cape because he's a druid and he's like an autumn druid. So you can see the changing of the color of the leaves. So what I did was up high, I should get something to point with other than my big, my comparatively big fat fingers here. Um, so up high, right? We're just, we're saying, oh, if it's higher, it's closer to the light. It gets more of the highlight color of the brown but it also looks cool to say the closer to the edge it is, the more brighter and yellow it gets. So this is actually probably the perfect miniature I could show to say that as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. So if I would have not highlighted this and just left it brown and highlighted down towards this really heavily, that would have looked fine. Or if I would have made this darker and highlighted towards this way, it would have looked fine. So, um, and once thank you all very much for your kind comments. And once again, I want to reiterate that I'm not showing you guys anything in this, or I'm not doing anything different on these miniatures that I'm showing you than what I just showed you in the class. The only difference is I get to spend more time on them because we're not just stuck in a two hour class. So I can sit there and back and forth and back and forth for as long as, as I need to there. So, um, 
So cool. Please, please, please. I love to see your guys' miniatures. I love to answer questions. I love to try to help you out with the sticking points that you personally are experiencing. So take your class mini or another mini you paint up after this one, work on it, send me some pictures, and let's talk about how to make you all buttery blending masters. Oh, and I almost forgot. Um, oh, and thank you all there. I almost forgot. Uh, do we have the code for them to get their, uh, their butter badge there? Um, hopefully we can give you guys the code to get your butter badges after, after all this there. Do you want me to check with John for that? That, that'd be awesome. If you guys would, right? Okay. Would mind. Um, I need three questions to answer. <laughs> three questions. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to provide my time here. Uh, will, yep. That's definitely, uh, mis mixing the paints on the mini itself is kind of wet blending. That's, uh, what you nothing wrong with what you're doing. It's a slightly different version of what I'm teaching, but it's all the same thing. And then Francis, how long did those take? It varies. Uh, I've gotten faster over the years. That big night with the tentacle coming out of the water was probably close to 40 hours. Um, the other two, maybe third high twenties to thirties. So I'm not a fast painter. I generally say that if I'm going to paint a cloak, I'm going to have to sit down for a four hour block and blend until my, until my eyes bleed. But, <laughs> but, um, but you don't need to do that when you're starting, just get, just practice a little bit. I finished my first Reaper con and I bought some mouselings and I took my little mouselings and I played around with the blending and it didn't look great, but I started to get the muscle memory down and the, how hard do you need to push on the brush and the, where to get the paint going. And then eventually it ramped up to, ramped up into a situation where I knew that if I spent longer, I got a better result of it. So thank you all so much there. I appreciate all the kind words there. And uh, yes, it, oh, thank you there, Claudio. I'm, I'm very happy it worked out so much. So cool. You guys have been an awesome class. I really appreciate all the uh, chat response too. That just makes it so much funner for me to do all this stuff. So thank you. Thank you all. So cool. So and you guys and I do there. have you said the butter badge. I have a mm -hmm. number here. Oh cool. Uh let's just type it in for you guys. All right. If you want to unlock your butter badges and wear them with pride as the blending uh masters that you're all going to become. Uh that is the code I was given. 71935 should give you sticks of butter next to your name there. So cool. Thank you. All right, then with that, is it time to figure out which of the factions? Won the uh, one things here. Looks like Arcos with 35% of the total participants gets uh, gets the victory on, on this one there. So cool. Oh, the number is 71935 uh, up in the chat. Just oh, sorry, that's actually that only went to all panelists there. Oh, my bad. Yeah, sorry that I meant to send that to the chat. Here you go. No worries. So cool. Uh, where do you enter the code? Um, go to the command uh, sub channel of this server and the the bot reiterates what you have to do to wear your badges with pride every every so often or every few minutes there so you should be good to go on that so cool and do you want to hand hand the control back to me while you finish wrapping I will up do that and then maria question about the fancy minis do you use more in between colors or just more brushing uh yeah, they're, they're, they're really not different. I would m spend more time. So I would make more of those little, I might make more of those little 50, 50 mixes, but if I got lucky and I picked my colors perfect and didn't have to, I, I wouldn't. The only time I would use more colors than what I showed you guys here is if I'm trying to make a cool color shift and then I might need a few more colors in my mix, but it's the same exact technique there. Cool. All right. I will pass. Uh, pass control of the meeting back. Thank you all and happy painting. Stop here.